Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Rachel Wojtek. We are continuing our conversation from last time. Last time when we ended, we were getting caught up in the New Jerusalem and the body of believers and how we are united in Christ and have different gifts and how that glorifies God. We're going to talk a lot more about that today. Where would you like to start? I would like to start with the anecdote that you shared with us before Uh, we went live. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, because it's it's a good intro. (laughs) Is it? Okay, well, here's the anecdote. In a former life, I was an intern at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. And when you are an intern at the Heritage Foundation, every couple of weeks you get a lecture from some of the faculty there about first principles, things that, what makes conservatives conservative and why are they conservative? Um, And this particular lecture was on the difference between conservatism, uh, I always struggle with that word, conservatism and libertarianism. Um, The speaker posited that the difference between these two systems is a view of continuity, where conservatives see a continuity between a nation's identity in the present and a nation's identity in the future. And of course, that connects to the past, and that's why conservatives value history. Uh, whereas in this framework, the libertarians would not see a continuity. They'd say, your decisions are your decisions. You're not bound by what your parents did, and so your children are not bound by what you did. Um, and in discussing this difference, the speaker um, decided to draw on Genesis 1 and asked, why did God have to tell Adam and Eve to have children? And I thought about this and I raised my hand and I said, well, is it because God is infinite and therefore his image is inexhaustible? And so multiplication of God's infinite glorious image is pleasant to him and good and glorifying and a wonderful thing. And the speaker said, no. (laughs) And I was like, Okay, where are you going with this? <laughs> and he said, clearly God had to tell Adam and Eve to have children because if he hadn't told them, they would have decided that their life was too good and they didn't need to have children. You know, they were in paradise. So the command is necessary because they wouldn't have thought of it themselves. They wouldn't have uh, valued it themselves. Uh huh. I won't make the remark I made earlier when I heard that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, Emily, your answer, of course, was a wonderful answer. And unfortunately, probably not the one that would come to the mind of a lot of commentators and theologians. The, the whole question of why, first of all, the fact that God says, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth three times, have children, have children, have children. Second, that he might still sneakily want that is something that most conservative evangelical Christians don't really think about. Even when they personally think that, you know, family values kind of go hand in hand with Christianity and having children is kind of a Christian thing, it tends to be on a more personal level of, well, I and my spouse want to have children and raise them for Christ and such. But there is there tends to be no wider vision for, and God wants all of his people to be doing this, because there's a game plan here that is bigger than bringing these individual families to Christ. It's bigger than the next generation. It's a lot bigger because the original scope of the command was fill the earth. And I think if you sat down with, again, the average evangelical pastor, teacher, commentator, and said, does God still want to fill the earth with his image? I I, I think some people would flat out say, well, no, we lost that in the fall. Others might say, well, he'd love to, but it's not happening because the fall. Three, uh, that would be great, I suppose. I've never thought about it. Um, but, but isn't the earth over full as it is? Yeah, there's that. Isn't the earth already full? Uh, and, and then you start getting, and, and, and there you start asking eschatological questions. Now, that's 
more of a secular eschatology, the world is already full and does not need to be any fuller. We are at the end of history. Everything that can happen has happened, and now it's just the, the clock's ticking toward doomsday. We're at 11.59 or whatever the doomsday clock reads these days. Uh, it, it, I suspect, is rare to find people who would actually say, well, of course he does. The one exception would be our premillennial friends, brethren, who say, well, yes, um, those who pass into the millennium and who don't have resurrected bodies incapable of having children, and this again, which brand of pre-mill are you exactly? Um, they might they might see that in in the in the future millennium after Jesus comes back, that there will that this finally will happen, because that there are brands of premillennialism that say, yeah, God's still going to keep His promise. He just can't do it through the gospel. He has to do it by force. So when Jesus comes, this can happen. Most other flavors of Christianity either haven't thought about it, look at it kind of wistfully of, well, it would be nice, but, or flat out say, no. In fact, there are some that are so strong that say that to think such things is, is borderline satanic because that's off the table and to try to put it back on the table would be, I suppose, something like the Israel trying to enter the land after God has already said, no, we've got 40 years of wondering. So that's kind of where we're, we're, what we're looking at today. Does God still intend this? What's he up to? What are his motives? Is he still going to pull it off? How is it possible, given, well, we're a chapter away from the fall in chapter 3? And, um, yeah, back to what, what, what's he up to? What's, what is the real goal behind this? And I think you came really close. I think there's some more we can say. But having thrown that out... I'm going to turn to the new kid on the block and say, Rachel, what do you think? What, what, as I was rambling, what thoughts came to your mind? Well, I think there are two aspects that we are going to be trying to address. And a lot of what you're describing, I think, flows from the individualism of American culture, where in the church, it's me and God, it's my devotion, I can worship him by myself. And then it becomes, oh, just my family. And we're very bad at seeing the communal aspect of the church and of the body of Christ. Um, and so we forget that God is building something bigger outside of us. We're also, we tend to be very nationalistic. So we just think of America. America has achieved, America is full and we forget about the rest of the world. And so I think some other cultures may have a little easier time understanding this that are more communal, although mm. you know, they, they miss the other side. Um, <laughs> but our side where we are so focused on ourselves, uh, we miss that it's not about us. Oh, the other thing I think is that in American Christianity, the concept of the image of God is often not even mm -hmm. discussed. Mm -hmm. As a kid growing up, I had never heard of, this is sad to say, but I'd never heard of Genesis 1 uh, <laughs> in the part that we're going to read until I came to uh, the Christian school where I was taught in junior high and high school where they read those verses and I went, what are they talking about? What? <laughs> and I had never been told that I was made in the image of God. And oh. I think many people in the American churches, that's not, you know, the basic message of the gospel. And so mm -hmm. we, it's in the Old Testament. So we kind of toss it to the side. But in the process, we've lost the value of the human being and of children particularly, which I think has done a lot to erode our ability to counter um, a lot of the falsehood in our culture that tries to find value somewhere else because we don't even know where we can find the answer for that. And sometimes we're taught that the image of God means we have a soul. Mm. Oh, yes. Which is um, not sufficient, I think, for <laughs> understanding how we reflect God. What we does don't it even mean really for know God what a to soul have a soul? Is often. Right. <laughs> it's kind of a wispy thing that lives in your mm -hmm. head or something. Yeah. It's a very uh, Greek view. It is. Yes. Uh, my wife faced this in her was it fifth grade Bible class yesterday. And they were all saying, our students were saying, um, yeah, God, all God cares about is your soul. He's really not interested in your body. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she said, resurrection of the body? 
Oh, but that's a spiritual body. She accused them all of mass heresy. And of course, and of I, course oh she, no, I, I'm recording in a different location, so I don't have my Gnosticism bell ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Ding. But yeah, that of course is what we're talking about. And I mentioned that to my class this day, and they all, yeah, they all chimed in, Gnosticism! Because <laughs> that's what it is, this contempt of, of the physical creation and the belief that the spiritual dimension is somehow, by nature, holier, uh, better, closer to God. Because God's spirit, and we have spirit, so that's where it all meets, right? And if we bear the image of God, if we're going to talk about that, it's that's talking about our soul, right? That's something spiritual, um, and, and, and doesn't have anything to do with our bodies. So even if you want to talk image of God, we're still talking about internal spiritual matters. We're not, the, the body just kind of gets drug along because, well, for now we have it. But salvation, that means, there we go again, dying and going to be with Jesus. No, nothing it doesn't. Before that. <laughs> nothing before that. Nothing before. Matters. <laughs> nothing and we're before. not really going to do anything after. <laughs> no, it's just that, that we're, we as souls stand in the presence of God, and that's salvation. And, and, and it's no wonder that so many young men find eternity, the prospect of eternity, incredibly boring, <laughs> because they're just going to sit there and hum, apparently. <laughs> well, they won't have throats or tongues or lips. I guess they'll think the melodies. <laughs> um yeah, it's a complete misunderstanding of what even a soul is, or what what that that spiritual dimension is. Uh, I, I think I faced this back when I was in college, talking to a, an intervarsity leader. I don't remember very well how it all came about, but I was put in the place of thinking, "Wait a minute, image of God is that just internal?" And mm -hmm. I began to think and thought, and it was something like this: Well. As, as the confessions define the image of God, as Paul defines it with a little help from Genesis, traditional, the traditional answer to the question, what's the image of God and man is, um, knowledge of the truth, righteousness and true holiness with dominion over creation. Uh, so knowledge, let's see, knowing and learning and understanding without a head or brain. That might be difficult. Living out God's commandments and exercising dominion over the lower creation without hands and feet, or again, a mouth, ears, eyes. Yeah, do you think that maybe the body plays a part in this whole image of God thing? Uh, to yes, we die, and the image of God remains in that dimension. And yet, when we're shown heaven, people are doing things. We don't know exactly how the soul manifests itself, but when people look into heaven, they don't see gaspy, airy clouds. They see people. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in this dimension, in this world as we know it, if you start losing parts of your body, all of this becomes more difficult. It is hard to exercise dominion not impossible by any means, but it's a lot harder if you're confined to a wheelchair. It's a lot harder if you have dementia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot harder if you're in a coma in mm -hmm. the hospital indefinitely. Uh, we kind of need our bodies while we're in this world, and what, how that works out in the other world, we're not told, and it doesn't matter. It's none of our business, or we would be told. And those but, kinds of damages are the result of sin, not necessarily the sin in someone particular's right. life, but those the, the, the fact that the sin capacity is in the world. to be well, damaged is the yeah. result of sin, yeah. and it's real damage. Yes, yeah. yes, it well, is damage. Think, it's not better, right? And we have to remember: we most learn or see the image of God when Christ became man, which mm -hmm. we the church fought hard to declare him to be fully man. That includes a body. Mm -hmm. um, and he best accomplished our salvation and therefore gave value to the body by doing that in the incarnation, not as a spirit that came and joined with a man or any of those things that the very body um, of Jesus is the son of God and therefore mm -hmm. gives value to the physical actions that he does. And we acknowledge this in, in worship saying that God acts through means. Mm. Um, if we, 
say that God saves us just by zapping us. <laughs> it's it's the same mindset of this is something magical. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if it's distinct from physical things, like we know that knowledge on a physiological level, stuff is going on in your brain. Yeah. You know, there are neural pathways and it's, it's very confusing and mysterious, but we know that somehow these things are connected. Knowledge seems so abstract, but it happens in a place in your body. Mm -hmm. And if that well, place in your body is damaged, then things get difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, how that affects the soul, we don't. No, because again, we haven't been told. Presumably, the soul, the inner person, keeps functioning somehow. And we, we often look say at someone with dementia, and saying, "Oh, well, poor, poor woman." But somewhere in there, I know the real person's there. Well, that's kind of an act of faith. We haven't been told exactly how that works. But since there's a resurrection, since God will fix everything one day, yes, there's healing one day. What it means now is hard to say sometimes, but we're, we're we're kind of going off into the here here are the problems. Let's kind of pull it back toward. So back to my first question, <laughs> um, we're we're seeing what God was not doing. God mm -hmm. is not a Gnostic. God did not invent the body as a stopgap measure uh, because he had something better in mind. God was not surprised or tricked by the fall. And thought, well, wow, I had this great plan and now it's all screwed up. Well, I guess Satan got me on that one. But let's try something completely different now. Um, when God made man in his image and said, be fruitful and... Well, let me read the passage. Rachel said we're yeah. going to read it, so I probably should. <laughs> and God said, this is Genesis 126, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then he provides food. And he sees everything that he's made, and behold, it's very good. So, as you've both been saying, from the beginning, this idea of man as God's image is wrapped up with God saying, and make more of you. This is not enough. Uh, and since this, God said that he blesses them in this, it, it's hard to understand how anybody who understands the Bible would look at this and say... Well, this was having children was simply a cross they were going to have to bear. They wouldn't have done it without God's commandment. <laughs> it's so, you know, it takes away your freedom and your liberty to be what you want. Isn't the world nice just, uh, has this guy been married? And if he has, has there, have his children heard this lecture? I don't I would be, think so. Or, I don't or, think he's married. Yeah, I can understand why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but think, uh, yeah, he, well, moving on. <laughs> uh, God, as you say, wants to fill the world full of his image. I want to add something that maybe was implicit in what you said, but I'd like to make it a little more explicit. I've written someplace that uh, even if God multiplied his image a billion times over in a billion different people, it still wouldn't that still wouldn't go very far because, as you say, God's infinite. And so what God has to be after, is, is something a little sneakier, a little trickier, or just put it differently, far more complex and deep than, than simply having lots of people, each of who bears the image differently. That would, be, that would be wonderful. But as you said, there's this communal aspect. He puts all of these people together into what the New Testament will call a single body. That is, each of us becomes a cell in a living organism that's growing and developing, Christ is the head, we're the body, and we have to grow up, Ephesians 4, we have to grow up to his measure. And when we do, and when that's done, then that interrelating, those interrelating cells have made something far more beyond the sum of the parts. And we have not simply individuals, lots and lots of them, who are the image of God, 
we have a body, we have a community, we have a bride. That's the image of God. And apparently, although it boggles the imagination, God thinks that that's a sufficient reflection of who he is, that he turns to his son and says, here's your bride. Hmm. And so it's more than individualism multiplied. Mm -hmm. It is very much communal and interrelational. And this is something that, that I tried to get at last time, and I, I keep trying, and I don't know if I'm not sure I'm actually communicating because every time I say this, it's like people don't process. So please tell me if I'm not being clear. <laughs> what happens in a community is that some people are better at some things than others. Some people are more dexterous. Some people have more abstract reasoning abilities. Some people are physically stronger. Some people are more aesthetically talented. Some people are better at languages. And, go, and you can go on and multiply this indefinitely. Because once you've listed all the things you can think of, then you can start blending them in parts and measures. So everybody is different. I once said that, that everybody bears the image of God differently. And one of our elders said, well, where's, where's the proof for that? <laughs> oh, I, my the thought fact was... That they are different people <laughs> yeah. around us? <laughs> yeah, that was my first thought. But I, I went instead proof by to... by identity. I'm sorry. <laughs> I went, to the, I went to the New Testament and said, members of the body of Christ. Oh, okay, I got it. Well, he was, he, he, that was a shortcut for him at work. <laughs> but if we're, if we're going to go with the, the classic definition, well, do we all know God the same way and to the same extent? Do we all know his world the same way and to the same extent? Do we all know each other the same way to the same extent? Do we all keep his commandments in the same Have we all matured in obedience to his law in the same way and to the same extent? Do we all exercise dominion with the same skills and gifts in the same way? To, and the answer really fast is, well, no, obviously not. We're all different. Now, that being so, here are some things that follow. You know stuff I don't know. You're good at stuff I'm not good at. Um, you may be good at it, and you may be good at teaching it. And if so, maybe I need to learn it. If I don't need to learn it today, maybe I learn need to learn it next year or next decade or next century or next millennium because we're talking about an unfallen world where there's no death. So if I don't need to learn your great thing now, maybe in a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand years, I will. Of course, by then you'll be a whole lot better at doing it and knowing it and teaching it than you are right now. Meanwhile, I'm learning stuff from other people. And we're all feeding into one another with what we know. We all are teachers after a fashion. And we're all helping and encouraging one another. Um, have you ever thought this about heaven, about eternity, about the resurrection? Have you ever thought about how long forever is? <laughs> I mean, really? Yes, forever. and I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, we, we, we have friends here and we think, oh, I'll be with them forever. Well, you know, let's, let's say there are only 10 billion Christians. I think that's way underestimating it, but let's say there are 10 billion Christians. How many people can you really hang out with on any given day? And, 150. And okay. You can hang out with 150 a day. It's, You're doing it's a scientific good. thing. Mm -hmm. I, I know you're, you're suppo <laughs> that's supposedly the number of people you can know well. Um, so let's say 150 people and you hang out with those 150 for a couple months. Think of all the people you're not hanging out with. Mm -hmm. Let's say you say, let's, let's just keep it at even numbers. You hang out with those 150 for a year and then you move on to a different 150 and then a different 150, then a different 150. We're talking 10 billion people. I have not bothered to do the math, but I think probably that's going to come out to be a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing. While you're hanging out with each new group of people, you're learning new things, having new experiences, sharing new adventures, developing new skills. So by the time you cycle back and meet those first 150 again, guess what? You're a different person. You're a different person. And it gets to start over. <laughs> but this time you're all more mature than you were by probably several tens of thousands of years. Again, I haven't done the math. And that keeps going through eternity. What if you get to spend that first year with, now, let's see, who can we count on to be a Christian? James Clark Maxwell, um, trying to go through the scientists who we know are Bible-believing Christians. <laughs> yeah, you can go down the list of, of, of Faraday. 
you know, you hang out with those people. Okay, you come back after that time. You are a great expert on electromagnetism. And then the next time you hang out with a bunch of Renaissance uh, painters, wow, 150 years hanging out with these guys? You think maybe you might learn to, to do more than stick figures? Possibly. And then you start, but then you start putting these things together. Electromagnetic I, stick figures. Exactly. <laughs> well, probably something a little more than that. Uh, this is the nature of eternity. Now, let us let me add something. Well, I'm just speculating about eternity. Let me throw this one at you. My grandmother, on my dad's side, was born in the late, very late 1800s. Her mother was a little girl during the Civil War. Hmm. So my grandmother lived about the time that the automobile was becoming a thing and about the time, just I think just before the Wright brothers invented the first plane. She learned to, she lived to see men walk on the moon. Since, but at that point, our telephone, we, we, when I was a little kid, we had this thing called a party line. I don't know if you know what that means. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, to get I long. I watched the Andy Griffith show. Yeah, exactly. To get long distance, <laughs> you had to call the long distance operator to have everybody through the call. Um, even when I was married, uh, we still, my wife couldn't call her sister who lived in, in South, South Carolina. Because the rates were too expensive. She had mm -hmm. to limit herself to calling once a week because we couldn't afford any more than that. Now you pick up any phone and you hold the some knowledge of the world, uh, probably <laughs> at a very shallow level. You have an orchestra. You apparently have diagnostic tools for medicine because anytime I get sick, my family flips open a phone and tells me what's wrong with me. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you, you can talk to anybody anywhere. Uh, and the average teenager, by saving his allowance, apparently, or, or badgering his parents, can hold one of these things in his hand. This has happened in the course of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. We've hit an exponential curve on technology. Now, whether or not that can sustain itself in the absence of a Christian worldview is another question. But you know what? In eternity, that's not a problem. <laughs> What if you have all of the brightest minds of Christendom for 10,000 years together, working together, seeing each other, communicating, and after 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, we've lost it. We have no idea what kind of technology. And this is one reason God doesn't bother telling us. It wouldn't mean anything to us. Hmm. If he just said, look, here's a technology you're going to invent, probably would say, wow, that's magic. Because... <laughs> I mean, Younger or older generations, if they could come forward and see what we're doing, what would they call it? Magic. It's magic. They, they, they have no reference point. This is what happens when you put a community of people together who work together peacefully, joyfully, honestly, in love, each preferring one over the other, each learning from one another, each humbling himself. They not only grow morally and ethically, and even in a fallen world, that's a thing. Uh, Jesus in his humanity, though he were son, yet learned he obedience by the things he suffered. In an unfallen world, there's no pain, there's no death, but there is testing. Uh, I can run faster than you can run. Let's see! No pride or rivalry, just fun. Uh, look at that mountain. It's a, <laughs> That's not a mountain, that's a sheer cliff. Let's climb it! Um, <laughs> okay, because that's what, if we slip, what's going to happen? The angels catch us? You know. It's still, that's still kind of hard. You know, here's a calculus problem. It's only, you know, a fourth differential. Uh, yeah, let's work on that. Right. Um, I know, let's build a starship and let's see if we can do it within 40 years. Okay, that's a challenge. And at each point, you trust God, you ask for wisdom, and you ask for help from other Christians because that's all that's in the world. And you die to self. You push on to trust God more, to obey him more fully, more deeply. There's a greater growth in righteousness. The image of God grows. And that includes both dominion, knowledge, or all three, dominion, righteousness, and holiness, and knowledge. And this goes exponentially into eternity. That's what was set before Adam and Eve. And I think in our gray dreary world, Christians are not ready for that vision. 
takes too long to explain it for one thing. This is the longest I've ever taken trying to communicate what I'm kind of seeing. Feel free to tell me that I still didn't do a very good job. <laughs> um, but I think uh, this is this kind of resonates on the level that we're seeing a revival of hands-on hmm. hobbies. Yeah. People people have realized that they don't know how to make bread, so they're going out and learning to make bread. Mm -hmm. They've realized that making your own clothes is amazingly satisfying, that they feel better after going out and picking flowers, putting their toes in the grass. Real life, the things that make up a real embodied life. Mm -hmm. um, we've and you noticed that they're incredibly important for being whole people. And you probably had to call Grandma or Aunt Sally to get some advice on how to bake the bread. Well, or you or, pick up your oracle of all knowledge. <laughs> the oracle of all knowledge, which was posted by somebody's Aunt Sally someplace or someplace, yeah. someplace they learned. Because, yeah, yeah, the technology speeds up the communication and, and makes it possible to learn things from people on the other side of the world who are dead now. But they pass it on to their kids and their kids remember, and their kids put it up on the internet, and now you can learn from them through this incredible technology that can keep getting better if... We don't rebel against God and bring it all down in a crash, which is always a possibility. Because the idea of this hope is not the same thing as saying, oh, and this is guaranteed, evolutionarily certain, uh, social gospel straight to earth to heaven, no problem, nothing could stop us now. Oh. Uh. <laughs> Was that Jefferson Starship I hear? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of things could stop us now, mostly our own sin and unbelief. Um, and and so in the beginning, as long as Adam and Eve were faithful, this this is what was before them. Uh, the New Testament calls it a new Jerusalem. We can call it simply at this point Jerusalem, Zion, the kingdom of God, whatever you will, uh, God's kingdom on earth. Uh, and it would have embraced all of life and all of their activity and everything they did, and everything would be worship and everything would be Christian love and charity, or godly love and charity. But there was this tree in the way, actually. Mm -hmm. There was man's potential sin in the way. In order for this to work, there is one thing that is absolutely essential, and that is that man must learn to live by every word of God simply because it is the word of God. The moment man thinks, got this covered, I can figure this out, thanks God, don't need you now, I got this going the whole thing comes crashing down, which, of course, is what happened. And then that brings us beyond to, so, when man fell into sin, did God abort the plan? Did God say, in effect, it's a great idea. Satan screwed it up. Satan, you got me once. And does Satan get to go through all eternity saying, yeah, I'm suffering in hell, here in hell forever and ever, but God, I got you. I screwed it up for you. You didn't get what you wanted. Ha! Have that. Because that's the alternative, unless we believe that God didn't give up, that God did something incredibly Yahweh-like and say, you think so? Watch this. <laughs> As it were, with one hand tied behind my back, with all the odds against me, with sin, with your own sin, with death and hell, with Satan... Man, and a crucial, man's own failure, man's own rebellion. I can still pull this off. Now, here's the thing. If you don't believe in a sovereign God, there's a problem. You may think, well, God would really love that. He'd love to see a world that loved him and that served him and that everybody loved each other and worked together. That'd be great. But you know what? Man has this thing called free will. And although in theory it should come out 50-50, somehow it always seems that people just reject Jesus most of the time. Well, the, it turns out that the gospel has not been terribly, terribly successful um, for whatever reason. Sin is just really strong, sin that's greater than all his grace. And um, yeah, that, that's, that's a nice vision, but it can't happen because sin is simply too strong, too powerful. And, uh, Either that or, or the fault lies in our technique. We haven't perfected the technique of evangelism in order to yeah. persuade enough people to believe yeah. in Jesus, which makes it our fault, which makes us, again, sinning and worthy of damnation. But, <laughs> well, yeah. And it, it leaves open for, for
for us a, a couple things. One, we are now bound to find that right approach. And within my lifetime, we've gone through a number of fads in evangelism and apologetics, uh, each one disdaining the simple gospel presentation for something that tugs at the emotions, the intellect, our traditions, our history, scientific knowledge and expertise, something that surely will convince people to submit themselves to Jesus. If we're looking for the perfect thing, anything less is unacceptable, mm -hmm. which we is why it leads to despair. <laughs> and <laughs> if you're not on board with this, you're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. You need, you need, and, and here's a wonderful attempt for more guilt dumped on Christians who really would like to see people saved. And they, here's an example, older couple in our church, a number of years ago now, we're visiting them and they said, you know, we really... We'd, we'd like to be more evangelistic and, and try to spread, share the gospel with Christ, but we're just afraid we're going to sound like Arminians, so we don't say much. Mm, that's so sad. Yes, <laughs> isn't it? And these, these were not stupid people. Um, I, 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 I don't know what went wrong there. We told them, it didn't sound like Arminians. You say something. You do, <laughs> don't. That's, that's a dumb worry. Just tell them, yeah. the, tell them what you know. Actually, I have a little rabbit hole yeah. from here, if we can take it. Um, I wanted to ask your opinion on this children's book because, well, I'll get to it. You'll see why I wanted to ask about it. Uh, it's, it's a fine book. It's called A Tale of Two Kings. Um, it's a gospel presentation that tells the story of the fall and redemption. Um, and so I, I enjoy reading it to Gretchen. Um, but there's always something to nitpick, right? Uh, mm. Because there's only one perfect book. Right. Right. So this is talking about how um, the effects of God's salvation, Jesus' resurrection. It says, through Adam's one act of disobedience, we were all made into sinners. Through Jesus' obedience on the cross, everyone who trusts in him will be made righteous. In Adam, we all died. In Jesus, we are made alive. True. I have, I have zero theological problems with these statements. <laughs> okay. Right? But I notice every time that in this paraphrase of Romans, yeah. they have left out the word all. In uh, Adam, all die. Right. So in Christ, all are made alive. <laughs> right. And Paul wasn't afraid to say that. Yes. But these authors <laughs> are. And that bothers me. Well, you don't want to sound Arminian. Exactly. And I, I think that's a problem. That's a failure to trust scripture. Mm. Um, I, you know, I can appreciate wanting to be precise and correct, but if it's leading you to reject the words of scripture, <laughs> or, you're not or, being correct. <laughs> or the, the, the words of scripture are only for the elite who are right. intelligent enough to appreciate and understand mm -hmm. them and not go astray. That, I'm not accusing these people of that, but you yeah, know, there no, are people I who do that and that's, point. that's a scary road. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of temptation not to speak because you won't say it right. Oh, yeah. Um, that's absolutely. so common. But, or I have to be able to explain it well enough, or you have to understand this well enough before you can be called a Christian or become a member of a church that we have created these false standards yeah. um, that then c cause us to shrink into the background and we don't speak um, because of the fear that we've put on ourselves um, <laughs> instead of saying the work is the Lord's and he uses my poor, meager, sad little gifts. We say, I must make perfect gifts. Um, and then we make it about ourselves and not about Christ. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, it does was, make it about ourselves. There was a young man who was joining our church again. This was quite a few years ago. Um, and he, he came from a, a family where the father was a church officer. So he was not Ignorant of theology, to be sure. But we, uh, we, the elders, were asking him, so how would you present the gospel to somebody if you only had a minute or two? And he hesitated and said, I, 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 I don't know. There's so much. And I could see his mind clicking through Christian worldview, systematic theology, you know, everything, because he, he was well taught. And I think there was in his mind that temptation of, well, you've got to say all this. 
and our, the man who was one of the older el elders at the time, and I both looked at each other, looked at him and said, how about believe on the Lord Jesus? We asked him, what, what, did, what did Paul say? So I don't remember. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be <laughs> saved in thy house. How about that one? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, the gospel. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. simple and straightforward. My wife credits her conversion to the verse, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It, it it can be that simple. Mm -hmm. It may not be, and you may have to go back, and you may have to bring help next time. <laughs> yeah. um, here's somebody, but you know, I, I I have encountered something I don't appreciate um, when one of my younger friends or students comes and says, "This guy has a question. We'd like you to answer it." Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you would do fine. Yeah, but I. <laughs> Why don't you, next time that happens, I think we'll say, you give it a shot, I'll stand here and listen. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, it's, it's the idea of, of I'm, I'm, I may screw it up. Now, all of this has been a tangent off of... <laughs> but I'm not done with my tangent. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, do your tangent off the tangent. What, do you, what, so what else? My tangent on the tangent, this, is, this tangent does actually return us to the topic. Oh, good. Um, okay. This is, again, from this children's book, A Tale of Two Kings, God's Story of Redemption. Um, there's an aspect that I think I really like, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out for discussion. Right. Uh, at the beginning, it's talking about how God created the world. And it says, God made people to be his representatives, to do his will, and to show the universe what he is like. Mm -hmm. And then later, after um, telling the story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, it says, Jesus the King is alive today, and he is still doing the job his father gave him to do. Jesus is filling the world with more and more people who show the universe what God is like. And I, I appreciate that there's a continuity there. Like this mm -hmm. was Adam's job that he failed at is yeah. filling the world with people who yeah. show the universe what God is like. I think that's a beautiful portrayal. Oh yeah. Um, but what are some of the uh, shortcomings or the strengths of expressing it that way? Do you think? Well, thank you for giving me lots of time to think about this in advance. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, You're not on the spot at all. <laughs> I I would have liked them to have done one more sentence to make clearer what they meant. Mm -hmm. I, I assume I know what they mean, and I assume, and I believe it's sound. But it does raise the question of so: is Jesus? Are we talking about just Jesus saving people? Like, that's the huge thing. But how about all those people who display God's glory without ever coming to faith in Christ? Mm. Who, who I, I'm uncomfortable with the word common grace, but I'll use it. Who in God's overflowing mercies to his people, let us say, mm -hmm. um, nonetheless show the incredible power, wisdom, and mercy of God in their inventions, their painting, their books, their art, their compassion, that's still part of what Jesus is doing. And then the dark part, and the wrath of men shall praise thee, the remainder of wrath you shall restrain. Even in hell, there is a sense in which God, Jesus, is still glorifying himself in those who, to some degree, positively, intentionally showed the goodness of God. And yet in the end, turned from that, rebelled against it, and are suffering consequences for all eternity. Now, this is a children's book, so you may not want to go there, and that would be, a, <laughs> there'd be a valid reason for not. But it, 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 I just would want to close the door against any hints on the one hand of universalism, or on the other of thinking that Jesus' kingdom is just saving people, and the only people who contribute to glorifying God in this world are Christians, born again Christians, because that path would lead to, um, well, was Shakespeare really born again? I mean, some of his jokes <laughs> in his language, I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's a monasticism, a retreating from the yeah. world, and it closes you off from a lot of God's glory. <laughs> yeah, it does. And so that, that would be a concern. I don't believe from what you've described that that's where they intend to go. 
Mm-mm. But you asked me to be picky, so there we go. Yeah. That's that's yeah. We're being over overly picky. I I will read this t- to my child with zero qualms. <laughs> yeah, and but I, I think I'm, it's important to say that it is getting at something we may often miss that a lot of bearing the image of God is the fact that we're reflecting the character of God to other mm-hmm. people. And often we get skewed in our beliefs or in the way that we live because we focus too much on the commandments as rules rather than as reflections of who God is that we then mm-hmm. live best by following those things because we're made in his image. So I think that is a good aspect of, it's not just we're telling people about Jesus so they can be saved in that more generic sense, but it's we're showing people who are who our God is because we should know more than other people do. And I think given our time constraints, that's maybe a good place to stop and we could pick it up here next time. Sounds great. Yeah. Let's close out with some recommendations. I'm going to recommend this children's book since we've already (laughs) talked about it. It's called A Tale of Two Kings, God's Story of Redemption by Gloria Furman. It's lovely. I cried the first time I read it. Aww. Aww. I don't know the authors. So yeah, that's yeah. that sounds like a wonderful recommendation. From Harvest House Publishers. Mm. I don't think I have anything else from them. But yeah. And oh, if if you um if any listeners are concerned, there are um artistic nope. <laughs> portray- oh, portrayals like, those feet? of no. Jesus. Yes. But there there's like always light over his face. Um <laughs> Or it shows him face down praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. <laughs> so it's uh, Presbyterian friendly. <laughs> <laughs> or at least Presbyterian light friendly. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Rachel, do you have anything? Off the top uh, of your well, head? I was thinking of the book that I recently got my husband David to read, uh, which is Robinson Crusoe. And the reason I was thinking of that is because uh, he and I were talking about it today as he's been reading through it and he got past the point where um, Robinson Crusoe is converted and how that changes his approach to everything and also Mm. the way that he sees his entire life and sees that everything he went through was preparing him to live on that island. Um, And so it's a great example of working out the image of God. And yet we also see in the story that it only goes so far until he needs somebody else or somebody else comes. But his immediate response is to share everything with that person, not Mm -hmm. to keep it to himself, uh, to teach Friday, and then to work together to get off the island. Um, So as we, as David and I were talking about it, it was kind of making me think of some of these things that's a small microcosm of what we would see throughout the world or we would hope to see. That's so cool. I've never read Robinson Crusoe. Oh, you, it's, you might. It's, it's difficult at first. Uh, it can be to get into it, I think. Uh, but once you get him to the island, it's it's fascinating. He's <laughs> His ingenuity is amazing. And his story of his conversion, where he's he realizes he can't do everything by himself, even though he's living by himself on an island. And <laughs> it becomes the Lord and his Bible um, as his connection to the Lord that in a sense becomes his community. So, And he's grown up in the Church of England, so his language is, is theological. It's yes. not American evangelical. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's you know, through the mercies of the new covenant uh, and the shed blood of Christ, you know, that kind of thing <laughs> rather than, yeah, just Jesus and me, I ask him to help me and he did. Which is, you know, not bad, but this is much richer. But you mm-hmm. must, must, must get an unabridged copy. Yes. Yes. And not every <laughs> abridged copy will tell you it's abridged. Because mm-hmm. it's way out of copyright and the publishers don't feel they have to tell you anything. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you should. Yeah, the abridged prob- version normally cuts out his conversion, which yeah. rips the heart <laughs> out of the whole yeah, book. Yeah, as, as unnecessary, because this is an adventure story. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to recommend now rather than next time a book by Dr. Gary North called Millennialism and Social Theory. Why? Read it and find out. (laughs) No, there is too much. I can let some up. So, um, you know, we'll talk more about this in the future. All right. Sounds good. Thank you both for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. You can find us on YouTube, Rumble, any of your favorite podcast catchers. If there's a place where we should be, 
and you can't find us there, please let us know. You can email us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. And we hope to see you next time. Oh, big thank you also to our financial supporters. You guys are the bomb diggity. Thank you for keeping the show rolling. We appreciate you. <laughs> Ask Kate. She'll, she'll tell you what. I guess. Okay. Good night, friends.